All right, we're live. Okay, let's see how that comes through. Hello, hello. I think you should be you should be good. I see you coming in on this I'm side. Good. You're good. I'm good. Okay. I think have we? I don't know. Have we solved the audio issues? Has it taken 12 streams to finally solve all of the audio issues? Are we good? We're good. <laughs> My goodness. Fingers crossed. Fingers crossed and cracked. Yeah. All right. You want to get into it? You want to just get into it? Or do you want a little, uh, little banter back and forth? No banter. Let's no just banter. get right into it. No Task. Banter. Machine learning no, only. Start. We're like machines learning, you know? That's what we do. All right. Cool. We stopped last time for orientation. We, we went over a bunch of image classification for pet breeds and stopped around this cross entropy loss, which just told us it's a different type of loss function, which works better, even if we have more than two categories. Which is what we're doing. What we're changing this deck. Deck. I keep, I keep not being able to say cat, cat dog classifier to uh, pet breed classifier. Pets being only cats and dogs. All right. And then we had a grand idea, and then we did a lot of detours last time, which were fun, I think. And we're ready to dive into softmax. I think is that right? That's right. Sounds right. Okay, should I? Is that a good size? Or should I amp it up one? Nice. This looks better. Yeah. Yeah. Hold okay. On. All right. I'm just moving stuff Holding. around. No, you're good. You could start. Do your thing. My thing? Do it's your thing. Our thing, Nick. <laughs> no, I mean, like, just, you know reading and being nice and you know that's ah, reading and being nice is my thing yes 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 yes, yes. <laughs> well i can't argue with that so soft soft max let's do it let's get going in our classification model we use the soft max activation function in the fact did we what's the next can you define this for me define activation function uh the activation function we're that's using, the that's like the sigmoid function, right? D does what? Sigmoid. It was, it just plots between zero and one. And it, no, the activation, so we wanted a differentiable function, which is why we don't use, unless that's the step function. So, oh, okay, so on the next line, right? Uh, in our classification model, we mm -hmm. use softmax activation function in the final layer to ensure that the activations are all between zero and one. Okay. And that they sum to one. Okay. Softmax is similar to sigmoid, which we saw earlier. Mm. Yeah. Right. Okay. So, okay. Yeah. So this function, that's why we don't use the step function because the step going from, you know, just zero and one is not differentiable. That's why we're using this like sigmoid ah, i remember we looked at this yeah yeah we looked at this curve that had the kind of like an jump s curve yeah yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. okay oh yeah right we're not going to be able to run any of this unless i start this notebook actually so let me do that first can you make us large Oh, for security, for, for security <laughs> reasons, or for whatever reasons. Yeah, <laughs> hold on. <laughs> Can I make us large? <laughs> All right. So Martin is um, copying for for Thanks. those who are new to the channel. Martin is copy and pasting a super secret auth code right now that we're not sure if anyone can uh, reverse engineer into anything useful. But where are we are keeping? I'm just gonna peek up. Oh, it was right before don't, he don't, pasted it. Not yet. It. it was right before he pasted it. I saw the empty field. Good. Okay, we're good. We're good. I can put us make back. It small again. I can make us yeah. small again. Okay. 
All right, so I gotta, what's all the stuff I gotta run here? There's a bunch of things we do. I guess we could ch probably use this as a way to do some sort of, you know, revisit of the content we went over since I, we gotta run these fields again. Yeah, sure. Yeah. So what are we doing? Your else, ah, uh, I remember. Oh, remember this? Antar data, our pending PR. Yep. Yep, I do. Now now I do. So. Mm -hmm. That was good. I don't think we need to run any of that. Uh, hold on one second. My computer is but at if... 92 degrees right now. <laughs> hot. Quite hot. I'm... Oh, it's because... This is the one thing that I have to do also when I just in my pre-stream checklist is close Docker because docker <laughs> will just make any yeah, computer just... like the slowest box that's true yeah and plus also use like tons of memory uh whatever yeah yeah, yeah. space uh-huh okay uh yeah we did this was some interesting uh deep dive that we did last time you remember into this regex label uh, and uh and uh Antar data function where we're like why is it not untaring our dot tar file very interesting you can watch the if you're interested in the interesting things that i'm saying you can watch the <laughs> recording <laughs> watch the <laughs> on youtube okay i think we're nearly there okay i remember this doctor i guess we defined that why did we define a doctor in here it doesn't make any sense. This is the. Oh, maybe we were. Ah, we were looking for some specific. We were pictures. comparing the augmentation because right. here is they were telling us that yeah, this like zoom warp and there you go right. with the mm -hmm. two balls. The yeah. The two balls. Okay, checking and debugging a data block. Remember that. Yeah, we could. We still haven't figured out why it's only nine images here. Yeah. Even whatever. if you want to show more. And then this is the output that breaks if you don't give it a, a resize function, but it's fine if you give it a resize function so mm -hmm. that they're all the same size. We don't need to run that again either. Let's just explore. Well, so it wasn't so that they're Not all here. the same size. It was so that the image was, was large enough on the, like that 460 was almost creating a canvas, right? to crop and rotate so if you rotated that 460 by 460 image by 45 degrees and then cropped that it was a 280 by 280 that crop fits within like the full square fits uh -huh. within that that's what he was saying because if you if you did it before okay. with the 280 by 2 or 250 um i don't i don't remember what the final size was it should be somewhere there but whatever if you rotated that and then cropped it you would get these like black corners because it was just dead space on that 45 mm -hmm. or 30 or whatever you're you know rotating it as but i think like any sort of uh, like if you don't apply and so we have this two right, right like the item transforms and the batch transforms the different and, and we've learned about them in this bare image that, that there's a bunch of stuff that gets applied on a uh like on a per per image level and then there's the batch transforms that get applied on the whole patch batch mm -hmm. in the same way and then i think just one requirement for that is that the whole that the bat, all the images in the batch have the same size otherwise you can't just batch apply any sort of transform on them mm -hmm. so this check here uh was it here no the other one the this one. check yeah just fails if you don't have a resize in there And I think it gives us oh, this output. You, that it... you need the uh, closing paren. Right. Thanks. Okay, so pipeline categorize final sample. Setting a pipeline to tensor. Building one batch, applying item transforms to the first sample, but there's no item transforms. 
or maybe you know, before batch. So uh, like it, right? Like it breaks here. It's not po possible to collate your items in a batch. You could not collate the zeroth member of your tuples because you got the following shapes. Yeah, yeah so I something. think I think we're saying different things, but they're both required. I think what you're saying is you uh -huh. need the item transfer, and what I was more kind of focused on was that 460. Okay. Was the was the value right. that you're passing in? So okay, like let's try your theory then. Like, what would be too small? Because like, I'm just running this to see that then it works, right? They have the atom transform. Now it's it, not complaining. I think it'll work with it whatever number that. you put in there. Well, not whatever, but you know, if you put like two fifty in there, right, or two sixty. Okay. I think it'll. it'll I also think it's gonna work. Yeah. Yeah, it's gonna work. But the the thing was now when you're shifting the and manipulating the images it's too small because uh it was using a larger image to learn from mm -hmm. so that's why the 460 was there so you're just saying like if we cut it with like two which is getting like this which is missing a lot of the image or what so I'm, I'm saying 15. like yeah if you if you took this image right let's say this was to uh what, what were we doing before 280 i think it was like 280 280 460 right? no 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 uh, okay yeah yeah so it, that was a thing at some point but i'm yeah. not sure even that might have been with the no that was 28 times 28 uh, numbers that's a while ago hmm. maybe it's the 28 I don't, I don't remember anyway but like when you move the image around you want to have enough space to with like after the trans after the after these augmentations to have enough of the full image of of the actual image and not just dead empty space pixels but wouldn't that depend on what what size we're giving for the transform like for the batch transform that we're applying like here because you can always make that smaller right you know like the little window that moves around on each Im image of the batch sure as long as that's smaller than the other one but i think it was saying that the 280 or, or whatever it was was like a good size and that's why mm -hmm. that's how we got to the 460. you know because i mean the smaller you put it the more information you're that. losing totally but um i'm just thinking that i don't remember uh-huh here it is there yeah. batch transform I, I was just like thinking that we don't i don't remember assigning the size for the batch transform but here it is yeah so i think the 224 I mean, whatever they're they're seeing that that's like a good size and mm -hmm. then the 224 fits within the 460. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. we could totally scale these up right 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 yeah. and scale them down and change the accuracy of the model but that was cool. that was the my my key takeaway from that cool so we've got two different key takeaways and both seem to be valid beautiful <laughs> nice it's always good because then you learn so much more right <laughs> double okay right, cool. cool so we so, got yeah. that stuff revisited and now we're moving on to our learner so i'm just gonna run that again could have done that in the meantime no optimization cool and then we're back to cross entropy loss which i don't think we have to run anything view activations and labels uh -huh. This was our great deep dive. <laughs> remember that? <laughs> I I don't want to remember this. I'm very classic of, oh, what are these numbers? One hour later, a lot of explorations later. This is what these numbers are. <laughs> okay. All right. But, you know, like it did look like the, the same transforms were uh, being applied on the It on does. The I think it's. Them. It was a very interesting discovery that there's it's this a, blue stuff here and there's very these terrible two golden ones. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> anyway. Right. Okay. We done? We're not done yet. Take your time. Oh, that's right. You timestamped that one. So what you, did I do? You, you timestamped this last one, no? Did I? Yeah. Timestamped? Yeah. For, for YouTube, right? For episode 11? Oh, I did. Yes, yes. Yeah, I yeah, time stamped. Yeah. I thought you mean like executing a cell or something. Uh, no, no, no. So you, you were just. <laughs> no, I did. Yes. Enjoying that, going back and forth. <laughs> I was. 
Anyway. Okay, I think we're done. I I still drain draining. I keep having so I for everyone who's wondering why I have such a bad accent, um there's this funny thing with Austrian German, which is not not really like that in in German German, that we don't make a distinction between a D and a T or a B and a P. It's exactly the same. I mean we have both of the letters but we just always pronounce them the same. I don't know why, but it's just a, an Austrian way of speaking. So I do this also in other languages, <laughs> which then makes me say drain instead of train and stuff like that. Is that all of Austria or is that just like yeah, specific it's all, regions No, it's all of Austria. Austria. It's Austrian German for some, for some reason. I don't know why. <laughs> and, and what are there other differences or is that just like the only, or oh, the I think it's like difference? generally, mm. It's just, it just generally more like a, a lazy, lazy German. Yeah, it's yes, yes, yes. I think that's a good description. It's generally more lazy. It's like all the words are kind of more soft and they just, you know, drizzle into uh -huh. each other. And you have these long, long things that are actually a couple of words, but it sounds like it's just one thing. Yeah, that's, that's interesting. How we speak. <laughs> yeah. All right, soft max. Can I run you already? Can I run the plot? No, it's still, it's still training. We got that grayed out favicon. Oh, you're right, too. Right there. Okay, let's read on. So here we're doing a sigmoid function. Softmax is similar to the sigmoid function which we saw earlier. As a reminder, sigmoid looks like this. This. I'm, I'm not even going to try. We can apply this. <laughs> I'm not even going to try. Oh, hey, you can apply this function to a single column of activations from a neural network and get back a column of numbers between zero and one. So it's a very useful activation function for our final layer. Single column of activations from a neural network and get back a column of numbers between zero and one. Okay. Now think about what happens if we want to have more categories in our target, such as our 37 pet breeds. That means we'll need more activations than just a single column. We need an activation per category. Hey, Martin. Thiv, Thiv yes. King. Thiv King is here. Thiv, Thiv, King. Thiv King. Hello. Hey. Nice to see you. Nice. Yeah. Hey, nice to see you again. Did you Drop see that in. you are... So we added a few metrics on our Twitch channel, and you are the number one contributor to the message. The message yeah, most characters and most most characters most words i think yeah yeah, yeah. Totally and and we're also twitch affiliates now it. thanks to you <laughs> exclusively <laughs> exclusively <laughs> so i have some i have some emotes or whatever we can give you for that <laughs> we still don't know how all of that stuff we don't works. really understand it yeah we don't know if we're using the right term or not anyway all right, where were anyway. we? Now think, worry. It's the sigmoid, it's there, look at it. We got our sigmoid function. Beautiful. So we're gonna have an activation function for each category, per category, activation per category. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Because it's gotta activate if it's like above a certain threshold fitting one of the breeds, is that, am I like conceptualizing this all right? Say that again. Um, I'm wondering, like, so it says we need one activation per category. So my, I'm currently conceptualizing it as a, there's like a certain threshold of when something is going to be considered to be a Chesapeake Bay Retriever, for example. And once it hits that thing, like once the activation for that breed, I don't know, triggers, then it's going to be classified as such. Is that what the activation function is, or, is, or am I so, misunderstanding? Hmm. We can apply this function to a single column of activations from a neural network and get back a column of numbers between 0 and 1. Okay, we know that. So it's a very useful activation for our final layer. Now think about what happens if we have more categories in our target. Okay, so before it was this cat versus dog. Mm -hmm. And we were only doing that. And now, we were just doing one, essentially, I think. We were, we were just saying, is it a cat right. or not? Yeah. That means we'll need more activations than just a single column. So we need per category. 
we can create, for instance, a neural net that predicts threes and sevens that returns two activations, one for each class. It's a good first step towards creating a more general code. Let's just use some random numbers with a standard deviation of two. So we multiply random. Okay. Uh, that's interesting that they're bringing back these threes and sevens here. Like that's from the previous example when we were doing digits, mm -hmm. right? Feels like it's kind of mixed in here. Yeah, let's see. Let's scroll Keep going. down a little bit. Do you need to run anything? We're, we're done training. Uh, yes, we're done training. We can hide there. We can run this set a mat random seat and then do something. What are we doing? Okay, let's just use some random numbers with the standard deviation of two. So we multiply rand number by two. For this example, assuming we have six images in two possible categories, where the first column represents threes and the second is zero, sevens. Okay, so it's just taking back this example to conceptualize this, I guess. Random manual seed 42, so that we can reproduce these numbers. Torch, random, make a couple of random numbers with that seed. And then we have our activations. So these are basically images. Is that right? 60, do they add up to 100? No, they don't. Uh, don't understand. We can't just take the segment of this directly since we don't get rows that add to one. We want the probability of being a three plus the probability of being a seven to add up to one. Okay. Activations.sigmoid. So we're making a sigmoid out of this tensor, like applying a sigmoid function to it, which uh, makes the two categories add up to one. Yes. No, it doesn't. Still doesn't. That's not a one. In our neural net created a single activation per image, which we passed through the sigmoid function. That single activation represented the model's confidence that the input was a three. Binary problems are a special case of classification problems because the target can be treated as a single Boolean value, as we did in MNIST loss. But binary problems can also be thought of in the context of the more general group of classifiers with any number of categories. In this case, we happen to have two categories. As we saw in the bear classifier, our neural net will return one activation per category. I'm still uh, stuck up with uh, with my not really well-established understanding of an activation function, I guess. Yeah. I'm hoping it's gonna come because I'm starting to trust this <laughs> resources. So let's just keep reading for a bit. So in the binary case, what do those activations really indicate? Hmm, maybe that's it. A single pair of activations simply indicates the relative confidence of the input being a three versus being a seven. The overall, overall values, whether they are both high or both low, don't matter. All that matters is which is higher and by how much. Okay, so that's why we can rescale it to be between zero and one, I guess. Mm -hmm. We would expect that since this is just another way of representing the same problem, that we would be able to use sigmoid directly on the two activation ver ver version of our neural net. And indeed we can. We can just take the difference between the neural net activations because, because that reflects how much more sure we are of the input being a three than a seven and then take the sigmoid of that. I'm not really following along well today. Do, can you, do you, did you? Should we go over it again? Do you want to explain it to me? Let's go over it again. Okay, you you, you go over read? it and then yeah yeah, yeah. yeah you go ahead. You want to start from here or wherever? You just scroll. I oh, know. Take it. Take it. Let me give control to you. How do I, okay. Nicholas? Let's see. Uh, Maybe you don't even have to ask. Maybe I can just do it. Remote control. Auto accept all requests. Bam. Wow. <laughs> so cool. Okay, I want to understand this. So. Teach me. <laughs> let's see. Let's see if I understand this. <laughs> All right. So we have our sigmoid function up there. We just read this. We can apply its function to a single column. Okay. This are we have six images and two possible categories for the threes and the sevens. Okay. I'm gonna ignore this for a moment. Torch what are you ignoring? This whole paragraph. <laughs> okay. <laughs> just look at the code. It seems kind of like, yeah, I, I, anyway. It's just a smaller example, I think, of what we're talking mm -hmm. about. So we can't just take the sigmoid of 
this directly since we don't get rows that add to one, i.e. we want the probability of being a three plus the probability of being seven to add to one. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. So this makes sense to me. It yes. Th and that's just an example. X.sigmoid is just an example that we can't do the sigmoid right away because it's not adding up to one. Right. And that's okay. what softmax does. So yeah. that was up here saying softmax is similar to the sigmoid. Um, we use softmax in the final layer to ensure that the activations all and that they sum to one. Mm -hmm. So out of the 37, it sounds like if we're using softmax, they will all sum to one. So like probability of being a pit bull, prob probability of being a laboratory, right. all of that stuff mm -hmm. will sum to one, right? Okay. Yes. Okay. I was just I just noticed how tricky it is that there's 37 pet breeds and that the other example we're referring to is distinct distinguishing between three and seven. Right. Which is 37 if you put them together. Wow. Wow, right? <laughs> it must mean something. <laughs> there's meaning. <laughs> you know, I or think, is it accident? I think I think there's like randomness. This you have this this new air about you, Martin, and I think it's because we're, it? we're we're affiliates now. It's the affiliate air. Everything has meaning. You don't. Yeah. 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 <laughs> All right. I we, don't understand anything anymore, and everything has meaning. <laughs> that's a great. It's a great development. Wow. <laughs> very very effective. <laughs> Spoken like a true uh, philosopher, over there. <laughs> Just over over the weekend, it's it's this affiliate air that's giving you so much wisdom. All right. So well, what's, okay. So what's the activation function? That, that's what we're getting to. I think these this three and seven was trying to be useful as like a useful example, um, but I think it it was more confusing. So let's, but maybe not. Like, I mean, this is nice. I can see this, whatever, these random numbers. These are just random numbers, right? And then it's saying we do sigmoid, it's not a one, but we want to see everything to add up to one. I understand as much. Yeah. So in our neural net, create in blank, whatever, our neural net create a single activation per image, which we pass through the sigmoid function. Created an activation. Mm -hmm. And we pass it through the function. That single activation represented the model's confidence that the input was a three. Binary problems that are a special case of classification problems because the target can be treated as a single Boolean value as we did in MNIST loss. But binary problems can also be thought of in the context of the more general group of classifiers with any number of categories. In this case, we happen to have two categories. Got it. Okay, as we saw in the bear our neural net will return one activation per category. Okay. Okay, I'm just, for now, I'm just thinking of the activations as numbers. That works for me in my head. So in the binary case, what do these activations really indicate? A single pair of activations simply indicates the relative confidence of the input being a three versus a seven. The overall values, whether they are both high or both low, don't matter. All that matters is which is higher and by how much. We would expect that since this is just another way of representing the same problem, that we would be able to use a sigmoid directly on the two activation version, on the two activation version of our neural net. And indeed we can. We can just take the difference between the neural net activations because that reflects how much more we are of the input being a how much more confident sure. I guess we are? Yeah. Oh, yeah. how much more sure? Wow. That word it just did blanked not exist. Out that word. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then, okay, and then take the sigmoid of that. Okay, so activations, we're taking all the rows and the first column, is that right? minus all the rows in the second column and 
so we're making the difference between the two numbers that we get for each of them and then we're saying uh then take the sigmoid function out of that so the second column the probability of it being seven will then just be the value subtracted from one mm -hmm. so it's the probability of it being a, f a three and then the second column is just the difference of like mm -hmm. one minus mm -hmm. that it sounds like mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. now we need a way to do all that that also works for more than two columns it turns out that this function called softmax it exactly does that okay, okay. no you can't run that all right, I'll give you the power of scroll back. Sorry. Jargon. The power of jargon too. Exponential function exp, literally defined as. So wait. Yes. Numbers. I don't. Um, why is it called activation? It's just a number. It's a number that uh, gives me the probability of it being any of the specific categories. It's cur currently what I'm understanding. I have the feeling I already learned this and I forgot about it, but, um, oh, all right. <sighs> Sigh of exasperation. Exponential functions, uh, exp, literally defined as e to the power of x, where e is a special number approximately equal to 2.718. It is the inverse of the natural log logarithm function. Note that exp is always positive and it increases very ra rapidly. Can I have, uh, so a little detour? Excuse me. So this weekend, uh, I spent some time at my parents' place and I cleaned through some old school stuff, you know? Um, you know, uh, whatever this is called. High school is probably the equivalent in the US. And I found so many mathematics books, you know, both like textbooks as well as just like, uh, what's it called? Notebooks that I wrote stuff into. It's like stacks of them. And I don't really remember much about it. It's, uh, it was impressive to see the amount of calculations that I did by hand throughout like this couple of years of school or whatever. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and that, that so much of it just seems to not have been relevant in my life, in my head, that it just all of this training, even, even like training it, you know, just dropped, drizzled off somewhere. And another thing I thought I maybe realized is that there is some difference to learning it in German and learning it in English that maybe makes it more difficult for me to remember because when I'm starting now to see all these terms again, like rediscover these math concepts, I cannot don't make this, which feels like it should be a natural connection between this is the concept because it's mathematical, it's the same in all languages, right? This is the thing. But for me, I get really confused with the different names and I'm, I'm thinking it's a new thing that I'm learning, but maybe I already learned it a while ago, uh, which to sum wow. up my detour, just uh, tells me how little I conceptually understood everything that I was doing. I never even thought about, like, that you probably learned, you know, that you learned this stuff in a totally different language. Where, like, now I'm thinking how, like, imagine I went and learned this in Greek. Like, I went and learned calculus in Greek. I don't, I don't think I would... I would understand much like it would That's be a, a totally different way of learning too i wonder though like isn't like math is like i don't know like music or whatever it's this like, like transcends language. languages right yeah <laughs> so it's just a, as long as you get the concept you should be able to it shouldn't matter really what language you're looking at it um, but so, yes and I don't no know, since it matters yeah. so much for me I, I think i think the process of getting some of these answers are different per language I think that's the way that you hmm. communicate certain things. Just like, because you're, you're, I don't know. I, all. Did you freeze? I feel like, did I? I don't think so. You're still here. No, you're gone. I was just very thoughtful right now. <laughs> what just happened? I think we're good. You might, you probably just don't hear me. I wonder you're still around on the stream or are you froze there as well. <laughs> I'm pretty sure we're still good. You're frozen. <laughs> oh, that was too much. Hi. <laughs> Let's tell him he's frozen. You're frozen. 
Oops. All right. Hi. Hey, welcome back. So you were frozen. So it was me who left. You okay. were frozen, um, but we kept hearing you. Oh, that's interesting. <laughs> <laughs> um, I welcome don't know back. what to say. Yeah, Just no, 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 no. Don't say anything. Only. Welcome back. Well, all right back. let's just pretend it never happened <laughs> forward huh yeah, yeah should yeah. i i should share my screen right yep go for it <sighs> all right back again okay everything aside there's all right this is good not that exp is always positive and it increases very rapidly because it's the opposite it's e it's just e let us check that softmax returns the same values as sigmoid for the first column and those values subtract subtracted from one for the second column same values as sigmoid for the first column and those values sub subtracted from one for the second column okay Shoop. first we can compare those 06 623 07446 it's not the same. Oh, oh, sorry. This is what we're going to compare to. That's the first card in red. 06025. Yeah, that's the same. And 03661. That's the same. And the second one then is 1 minus this number. And here we are. Beautiful. Softmax is the multi-category equivalent of sigmoid. We have to use it any time we have more than two categories and the probabilities of the categories must add to one. And we often use it when, even when there are just two categories, just to make things a bit more consistent. We could create other functions that have the properties that all activations are between zero and one at the sum to one. However, no other function has the same relationship to the sigmoid function, which we've seen is smooth and symmetric. Also, we'll see shortly that the softmax function works well hand in hand with the loss function we'll look at in the next section. If we have three output activations, such as in our bear classifier, calculating softmax for a single bear image would then look something like below, maybe. Output 0 0.02 exponent. Uh, what's that? How was the exponent in there? Hold on, go back down. Exp Sorry. Yeah. Um, what was the relation to the exp? I don't. It, it was just as you were scrolling down, but I don't remember. I was trying to maybe make sense out of this one. Um, were you or were you just not listening, Nick? No, I was trying to see if this just makes sense, but. Does it? We have three output activations. Are they all? Three, right. Oh. So we have three categories, Teddy Grizzly Brown, and we want to make them all sum up to one. That's what we're using softmax for. This makes sense. EXP uh, is that, yeah. Scroll was up this, a little right? bit. Yeah, right there. There, here. OK, so it's just that's something we're using for the softmax. E is a special Always number. Always positive. OK. So that's E. It is the inverse of the natural law. Okay. Note that X is always positive and it increases very rapidly. So it's just so it's just telling us it's using the EXP for that. I don't know what exactly. EXP is just E to the power of X. And so it seems like it's something max, similar. Yeah. So softmax is y use that is the exponential of so e so softmax of x is e to the power of x divided by e to the power of x sum dim what is i don't know what oh, there must be some one. sort of dim dimensions dimension, i think keep dimension true which probably depends on like you have a uh, higher dimensional softmax i assume if you have um, more categories maybe so it could be 
right? Like x, x is the number that you're passing in, and then maybe if it's three categories, this dimension would be three. I don't. I have no idea. Could be. I'm just saying it could be. <laughs> sure. It could be a lot of things. It could be a lot of things. That's right. <laughs> but it, it makes kind of sense because we're just having one, you know, one additional dimension. <laughs> Let's keep going. Keep it keep it moving. Keep it moving. Go ahead. You keep it moving. Me. Okay. All right. What does this function do in practice? Taking the exponential ensures all our numbers are positive, and then dividing by the sum ensures we are going to have a bunch of numbers that add up to 1. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. The exponential also has a nice property. If one of the numbers in our activations x is slightly bigger than the others, the exponential will amplify this since it grows well exponentially. Yeah. Which means that in the softmax, that number will be closer to 1. Okay. Mm -hmm. Intuitively, the softmax function really wants to pick one class among the others. So it's ideal for training a classifier when we know each picture has a definite label. Note that it may be less ideal during inference, as you might want your model to sometimes tell you it doesn't recognize any of the classes that it has been during training, okay? And not pick a class because it has slightly bigger activation score. In this case, it might be better to train a model using multiple binary output columns, each using a sigmoid activation. Cool. I understood okay. that. Mm -hmm. Okay, so softmax is the first part of cross entropy loss. The second part is log likelihood. Hit it. When we calculated the loss for our MNIST example in the last chapter, we used MNIST loss. That was the loss function we defined. Inputs targets, inputs, we used the sigmoid function on the inputs, and then we returned a torch dot where. One targets equals equals one, everything where the targets equal one, one minus inputs, inputs. I'm, I don't really remember what that was. Do you remember? Oh, maybe it's going to be explained. Just as we moved from sigmoid to softmax, we need to extend the loss function to work with more than just binary classification. It needs to be able to classify any number of categories. In this case, we have 37. Our activations after softmax are between 0 and 1, and sum to 1 for each row in the batch of predictions. Our targets are integers between 0 and 36. In the binary case, we use torch where to select between inputs and 1 minus inputs. When we treat a binary classification as a general classification problem with two categories, it actually becomes even easier, because as we saw in the previous section, we now have two columns containing the equivalent of inputs and 1 minus inputs. So all we need to do is select from the appropriate column. Let's try to implement this in PyTorch. For our synthetic threes and sevens example, let's say there, these are our labels. So that would be, it's a seven, it's a three, it's a seven, it's a three, three, seven, I guess, for the other way around. And these are the softmax activations, some acts. Where did that come from? Where did that come from? I don't know. SM activations are oh, here. Mm -hmm. So we're just using that. Uh -huh, okay. So we're using this softmax function. Gotcha. Zero six. And that adds up to one. Okay. Okay. So these are the softmax. Gotcha. Then for each item of the targ tensor. We can use that to select the appropriate column of SMX using tensor indexing, like so. Index equals range six. SM activations index target. Uh, what is this? Each item of target. We can use that. So we're using the SMX to select the appropriate column of SMX using tensor indexing. So we're figuring out where this tensor arguments, this is a zero. So it should be the zeroth column here. One, that's 
in this column 0 1.3 that's from this column so these next two should be from that column 0 3 4 and they should be again on that column so this tells us which columns i think are these meant to be the labels did i understand that correctly are these not the softmax outputs no that's or... down here those are the softmax outputs the activations what is what is this tensor targ I think it's just the la I think it's labels saying these are our labels. Yes, yeah. let's say yeah, these are our labels. This would be a three. This would be a seven or something. Okay. Oh, there it yeah, is. yeah. And then what they're telling us here is just which column to choose essentially. So it's saying this the first one is zero, so it should be in this column. The next value is here because it's one. The next one is zero, so it's again the zero column, etc. Then there's two ones, and then there's another zero. And that's what it picks here. Those are the, I'm not sure why, but mm -hmm. to see exactly what's happening here, let's pull all the columns together in a table. Here, the first two columns are our activations. Then we have the targets, the row index, and finally the results shown immediately, immediately above. P HTML, it's gonna, wow, it's gonna build an HTML table, look at that. <laughs> <laughs> From a data frame okay so it's naming the two columns three and seven so yeah the first one is when it's a three the second one when it's a seven and then it's adding some other stuff got an index t arc that's our label three so it's 0 0.6 percent sure it's a three and here interesting so this is misclassified yeah. actually mm -hmm. yeah this one is also misclassified quite severely. What? This is totally misclassified. Am I misunderstanding that? That's how I'm getting it too. That's just what. Huh. Interesting. But the loss on that one is just so like. It's got a really low loss. Look at that. But it's if it, it should be a seven from what I'm so the loss is this, in this case, it was the same as the seven, three, three, six, zero, but maybe that's because it's. Oh, it's all, it's always actually the same as the one that it's supposed to be. Yeah. So this is one, well, so that this makes is sense. zero. That makes sense because it's. Why? Because they both of them add up to one. So the loss is always going to be the other in this case. So whatever's in the first column plus whatever's in the second column will always equal to one. Yeah. So. Why is that? How is that related to the loss? Because the loss is just whatever the, because it's just one minus the other one. Okay. Right. I don't know. Maybe. So, so the target on this one, I, the word target is throwing me off. Right, like if it's supposed to be a three in that first row, Target. right? If the first one's supposed to be a three. You know what I thought that this means? I thought it means a tensor argument. <laughs> but I think you're very correct in that it's about targets since it's label, des describing some labels. <laughs> yeah, so that's that's kind of what's throwing me off, right? Because like in that first row, you have six, 602, whatever. Um, yeah. It thinks it's a three. And then if the target is supposed to be zero, right? That first, it's supposed to be a three. Then it would be correct. Then it would be correct. But it's saying the loss uh -huh. is is that, which is so weird. So, with so maybe that, that one is misclassified. And then the other but ones. The, they're all the same. That it, They're all following that pattern, which is why this target uh -huh. is, is kind of throwing me off. Like, it's almost like the target is the opposite one. Uh-huh but maybe I'm not understanding what target actually means, right? It's not actually always, look, because the first one, uh, the higher number is not, is the one that it's it says it is, and in the second one, the lower number is the one that it says it is. Then again, no, no, it's no. the- No, it's, it's with the loss though. If you look at the target index, that follows the loss. So zero is six, one is yes. four, zero is 1.3, right? One is zero, zero, three. <laughs> So that's, that's what I'm saying is like, if the target is supposed to be a three, why is the loss the same value as the target? It should be, 
the difference between that and one, which in this case, because there's only it, two, think. it's whatever the number is in seven. Hmm. You know, so we could sc scroll up, scroll uh, or it. hold on, uh, up, up. Go ahead to Take it. see. Do it. <laughs> so let me hold on. I'll just request remote control again. Oh, you need to? I thought I just told you. Ah, because I got you kicked left, off. Huh? Came back. Yeah. <laughs> nice. Um, so, let's see. So all we need to do is select from the appropriate column. Let's try to implement this in PyTorch for our synthetic threes and sevens example. Let's say these are our labels. Yeah, I really don't understand this, but let's see, because this is now going to explain it. Mm -hmm. Looking at the table, calculated by the target index columns, our indices in the two. Okay, that's what all right is actually doing. We really the really interesting thing is actually works just as well with more than two columns. The then targ contained a number from zero to nine, as long as the activation columns sum to one. Okay, it's still not telling me what targ is. I think it is what we're trying to get. But I want to know why the loss is so high here. How is it calculating the loss here? So, loss. so this Range column and this six. column I think it's it's getting okay I am unless in all of these they they are misclassifying like the target you know what I'm saying like the target is zero like we want this one but in this case it's classifying it as a seven which would make sense it's saying that it should have been a three we classified it as a seven so the targets correct and the loss is this mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so that could be the case where we're only looking at these and basically what they're saying is that on each one of these six examples it got it wrong uh, and because we just we actually made this like we completely made the the loss uh, uh what's it called softmax the softmax yeah we made it out of nothing like it wasn't based on anything so essentially this could be like a you know a, a random in, in initialization of assuming it's a three or a seven and it, then it, that's it where feels it would start like this whole this whole section is trying to just say like look before we did it with this binary is it or is it not but now we're going to apply this like a little bit of math to you know showcase what it might be closer to using the softmax exponential function mm -hmm. and we're still going to mm -hmm. plot it between zero, 0 and 1 but it seems like they wanted to just drive the fact that you can do the softmax function even if you are doing just these two binary options like is a cat is not a cat um and then it's slowly showing like look yeah oh we could do it you know not just threes and sevens now we could do it zero through nine as long as you know they sum up to one um so i think if we just i think they're just like re-explaining something or they're just in this case they're just trying to drive the point home but it sounds like we kind of get it so i'm not sure I, I seem like I'm getting more confused, but uh, maybe I know, it's going to come back. That, that's why I'm saying, like, I think the way that they're driving the point home is just a bit more confusing. But mm -hmm. I don't know. Let's, yeah, tell me if it's if it's uh, more confusing as we keep going. Yeah. All right. We're only picking the loss from the column containing the correct label. We don't need to consider the other columns because by definition of softmax mm -hmm. they add up to one up to one minus the activation corresponding mm -hmm. to the correct label therefore making the activation for the correct label as high as possible must mean we're also decreasing the activations of the remaining columns pytorch provides a function that does exactly the same thing as 
SM acts. Okay, except it takes the negative because when applying the log afterwards, we will have negative numbers called the NLL loss, NLL negative log, negative log likelihood. I've heard that word before, term. I've heard that term before. <clears throat> Despite its name, the PyTorch function does not take the log. We'll see why in the next section, but first let's see why taking the logarithm can be useful. Okay, I'll be back in just a second. Let's go a little bit ahead. The function we saw in the previous sections work, works quite well as a loss function, but we can make it a bit better. Problem is your probabilities cannot be smaller than zero or greater than one. Hello. Uh. Sorry, I need some sort of like food or coffee. <laughs> yeah. Or chocolate. Get it? Chocolate. Chocolate. Look at that. Is that what you got? I had chocolate before. I just okay. got myself some milk, but I guess I had a similar impulse as you. <laughs> oh, I have cookies. I'm going to go get some cookies. Woo! <laughs> Snack time. <laughs> yeah. Okay, in the meantime, I shall look at this and not understand it. Despite its name, it does not take the log. Can you draw in Jupyter Notebooks? <laughs> Maybe HTML canvas or something? Interactive canvas and Jupiter. So what are you doing now? Um, <laughs> We're going to draw. Uh, I was just interested whether you could you know, like easily get a cell where you can actually just draw with the mouse. It could be fun for understanding some stuff to scribble along for me. I was just wondering whether Jupiter has some sort of inter sorry, interactive cell, maybe with using HTML canvas or something. Hmm. Uh, anyways, not important, just interesting. Close, close. Keep going. Okay, taking the log. How are your cookies? Delicious. Mm -hmm. The function we saw in the previous section works quite well Cheers. as a loss function, but we can make it a bit better. The problem is that we are using probabilities and probabilities cannot be smaller than zero or greater than one. It means that our model will not care whether it predicts 0 0.99 or 0 0.99. Why not? Indeed, those numbers are so close together but in another sense, 0 0.99 is 10 times more confident than 0 0.99. So we want to transform our numbers between zero and one to instead be between negative infinity and infinity. Why? There is a mathematical function that does exactly this, the logarithm, available as torch.log. Now available as torch.log from your nearest coffee shop. It is not defined for numbers less than zero and looks like this. Plot function torch dot dog. Oh, hello. Whew. Very elegant. I like this shape. Yeah. Does logarithm ring a bell? Does it?
the logarithm function has this identity y equals b to the power of a a equals logarithm of y comma b It's the inverse thingy of the expo exponent. In, in this case, we're assuming that logarithm yp returns log y base b. Our PyTorch actually doesn't define log this way. Log in Python uses a special number e, 2.718, as the base. OK. Perhaps a logarithm is something that you have not thought about in for the last 20 years. So yes, but it's a mathematical idea that is going to be really critical for many things in deep learning. So now would be a great time to refresh your memory. The key thing to know about logarithms is this relationship. Logarithm of a times b is the logarithm of a plus the logarithm of b. When we see that in when we see it in that format, it looks a bit boring. But think about what it, this really means. It means that logarithms increase linearly when the underlying signal increases exponentially or multiplicatively. Multiplicatively. This is used, for instance, in the Richter scale for, uh, of earthquake severity and the decibel scale of noise levels. It's also often used on financial charts where we want to show compound growth rates more clearly or more recently in COVID numbers rising. Computer scientists love using logarithms because it means that multiplication, which can create really, really large and really, really small numbers, can be replaced by addition, which is much less likely to result in skills that are difficult for our computers to handle. Sylvain, it's not just computer scientists that have logs. Until computers came along, engineers and scientists used a special rule called the a slide rule that did multiplication by adding logarithms. Logarithms are widely used in physics for multiplying very big or very small numbers in many other fields. Have you ever seen a slide rule? Is that like with a lot of beats on it? No, that's is that um, what it is. An abacus. Uh -huh. It's very different. Huh? Hmm. My that's gonna work. My calculus professor would like be like, we don't, we didn't have uh, graphing calculators back in my day. We use slide rules, and we're like, all right, cool. And he brought one in once and showed us how it worked. Uh, I don't remember. Does it work? I don't remember exactly how it works, but the middle part can like slide back and forth, and then you have this like window with like that ruler. Yeah. What does it tell me though? Three. Oh, there's P. Pi. You can slide stuff, huh? That's what I understand. That's the idea. Five. <laughs> Eight, four. So let's see what happens, whether there's a spot where we can align three and seven, which is probably the meaning of life or something. It doesn't coincide, huh? Oh, wait, maybe. This is close, somewhere in here. Between three and seven. Ooh. <laughs> or there, there's another somewhere in between three and seven. Well, it's I mean, that's three. between three and six. It depends what you look. Yeah, you're right. Mm -hmm. No, 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 no. Here's the six. Look, here's a little three, and then here's a seven. I know, but that's still six. What I'm saying, we're like 6.7. You never know. Okay, so we don't have to use this. <laughs> I, I don't think so. Bye, bye, bye. No, we're using PyTorch. Different kind of slide rule. Uh, taking the mean of the positive or negative log of our probabilities, depending on whether it's the correct or incorrect class, gives us the negative log likelihood loss. In PyTorch, NLL loss assumes that you already took the log of the softmax, so it doesn't actually do the logarithm for you. Hmm. 
Warning, confusing name. Beware, the NLL in NLL loss stands for negative log likelihood, but it doesn't actually take the log at all. It assumes you have already taken the log. PyTorch is a function called log softmax that combines log and softmax in a fast and accurate way. NLL loss is designed to be used after log softmax. When we first take the softmax and then the log likelihood of that, the combination is called cross entropy loss. In PyTorch, this is available as cross entropy loss, which in practice, ac practice actually does log softmax and then NLL loss. Loss function and then cross entropy loss. As you see, this is a class. Instantiating it gives you an object which behaves like a function. You can call it loss function. Object behaves like a function. Okay. <clears throat> Activations and targets, we can pass that and we get a single output. All PyTorch loss functions are provided in two forms class just shown above and also a plain functional form available in the f namespace i wonder what that is about i'm sure it has like a really smart reason f dot cross entropy like why it has this f name function namespace f dot cross mm -hmm. either one works fine and can be used in any situation we've noticed that most people tend to use the class version and that's more often used in pytorch's official docs and examples so we'll tend to use that too Okay. By default, PyTorch loss functions take the mean of the loss of all items. You can use reduction equals none to disable that. Take the mean of the loss of all items. Okay, so that's where we get one output. And if you say reduction equals zero, we're going to get all of them. There they are. An interesting feature about cross entropy loss appears when we consider its gradient. The gradient of cross entropy AB is just softmax A minus B. Since softmax A is just the final activation of the model, that means that the gradient is proportional to the difference between the prediction and the target. This is the same as mean squared error in regression, assuming there's no final activation function such as that added by Y range. Since the gradient of A minus B to the power of two is two times A minus B. you freeze I think you're frozen no, I was no, just pretending, you're, you're to pretending to be pretending to be frozen I saw your eyes blink and I was like oh man I'm gonna text <laughs> chat with him uh, Martin I didn't Smith. understand anything here I was just reading it and it passed right through me mm -hmm. okay you do help me out here help help with what where did you um help putting this information in my brain okay an interesting feature about cross entropy loss how appears when we consider its gradient okay uh the gradient of cross entropy a, a b is just softmax a minus b since softmax a is just the final activation of the model that means that the gradient is proportional to the difference between the prediction and the target this is the same as mean squared error in regression assuming there's no final activation function such as that added by y range since the gradient of a minus b 2 is 2 times a okay Oof. You too? Yeah, man. <laughs> because the gradient is linear, that means we won't see sudden jumps or exponential increases in gradient, which should lead to smoother training of models. Okay, whatever. <laughs> I don't know. I'm not. I'm not getting it right now. It's, it seems I'm, I'm missing some sort of mathematical. Um, basic understanding of a lot, a lot of these things to, to piece it together well, I guess. Or, but maybe, maybe it's you know we're, maybe we're reading too much about baseball rules and we should play a bit more. Mm -hmm. I'm, I have the feeling at the moment because I'm kind of like getting lost and I'm like, uh, what? All right, I think on the last stream too, we were like, we were saying that on this one, we're just gonna try to breeze through this see what the difference is training wise we got a bunch of cells left to go okay let's just breeze 
yeah, you have not seen all the pieces but yeah, yeah let's like skim well read but skim and breeze and then cool. start applying right let's start playing baseball well while this puts a number of uh, number on how well a bad ml is doing does nothing to help us to know if it's actually any good let's see how I interpret the models predictions it's very hard to interpret loss functions directly because they're designed to to be things computers can differentiate and optimize not things that people can understand that's why we have metrics these are not used in the optimization process but just to help us poor humans understand what's going on in this case our accuracy is looking pretty good already so where are we making mistakes we saw that we can use a confusion matrix to see where our model is doing well and where it's doing badly. We can do that. Confusion matrix. Oh dear. In this case, we don't even haven't seen it yet, but it's already it's gonna be bad. Oh, it's hard to read. Okay, we have thirty-seven different breeds of bad. Yeah, this is gonna be big. Which means we have thirty-seven times times thirty-seven entries in this giant matrix. Whoop! There it is. I mean, it looks pretty good, to be honest. Not that difficult to read. Lots of zeros around. Instead, we can use the most confused method, which just shows us, <laughs> which just tells us about the status of Martin right now. Uh, the sense of the confusion matrix. Yeah. <laughs> most incorrect predictions here. Beagle should have been a Basset Hound, I think, Bengal should have been an Abyssinian. Since we are not pet breed experts, it's hard for us to know whether these category errors reflect actual difficulties in recognizing breeds. So again, we turn to Google. A little bit of Googling tells us that the most common category errors shown here are actually breed differences that even expert breeders sometimes disagree about. So this gives us some comfort that we're on the right track. We seem to have a good baseline. What can we do now to make it even better? You want to read? Yes, no. Sure. Okay. We will now look at a range of techniques to improve the training of our model and make it better. While doing so, we will explain a little bit more about transfer learning and how to fine tune our pre trained model as best as possible without breaking the pre trained weights. The first thing we need to set when training a model is the learning rate. We saw this in the previous chapter that it needs. Uh, that it needs to be just right to train as efficiently as possible. So how do we pick up, pick a good one? FastAI provides a tool for this. The learning rate finder. The learning rate finder. One of the most important things we can do when training a model is to make sure that we have the right learning rate. If our learning rate is too low, second all right the learning rate finder one of the most important things we can do when training a model is to find is to make sure that we have the right learning rate if our learning rate is too low it can make it can take many many epochs to train our model not only does this waste time but it also means that we may have problems with overfitting because every time we do a complete pass through the data we give our model a chance to memorize it Got it. So let's just make our learning rate really high, right? Sure. Let's try that and see what happens. I think this is going to just bounce away eventually, right? Mm -hmm. And start getting worse and then not get in that. It's not going to get into the middle. Uh, this is the thing when we like take take too big of a distance and it jumps over the curve. Is that it? That's what I think is happening. Uh -huh. Yeah, right here. The optimizer stepped in the correct direction, but it stepped so far that it totally overshot the minimum loss. Repeating that multiple times makes it go farther and farther, not closer and closer. Yeah, so they're just showing us what they explained before. Mm -hmm. um, what do we do to find the perfect learning rate? Not too high and not too low. In 2015, the researcher Leslie Smith came up with a brilliant idea called the learning rate finder. This idea was to start with a very, very small learning rate, something so small that we would never expect it to be too big to handle, too big to handle. We use that for one mini batch, 
find what the losses are afterwards, and then increase the learning rate by some percentage. For example, doubling it each time. Then we do another mini batch, tracking the loss and double the learning rate again. We keep doing this until the loss gets worse instead of better. This is the point where we know we have gone too far. We then select a learning rate a bit lower than this point. Our advice is to pick either one order of magnitude less than where the minimum loss was achieved, uh, minimum divided by 10, the last or the last point where the loss was clearly decreasing. The learning rate finder computes those points on the curve to help you. Both these rules usually give around the same value. In the first chapter, we didn't specify a learning rate using the default value from the fast AI, which is uh, one e minus three. So uh, this is this has to wait. I'm for running the other to, one to learn. Uh, it's yeah. still training. That was a bit unnecessary. I could I guess I could stop it. Or is um, this, yeah, because it's not related. Well, let's see the output. I guess it's interesting. Yeah. Should be done after this, no? Mm -hmm. No, one more. This one's pretty quick. Whatever the second one is that it does. Yes, here we are. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's really high. Interesting. Okay. So here we are finding the learning rate. So it does a like it essentially does a training there, right? Like a couple of it's epochs, doing a couple of epochs of yeah. mini batches. And just yeah. Keep keep ex like increasing it. We can see on this plot soon. We will be able to see on this plot in the range. 1e minus 6 to 1e minus 3. Nothing really happens and the model doesn't train. When the loss starts to decrease until it reaches a minimum and then increases again. We don't want a learning rate greater than 1e minus 1 as it would give a training that diverges like the one before. You can try for yourself. But 1, there it is. So nothing much happens to 10 to minus 6 to 10 to minus 3. Then it decreases 10 to minus 1 and then goes up again. Cool. That's a cool uh, graph. Yeah, agreed. It has some scribbly lines here. It has a smooth curve here. Anything that satisfies the aesthetics of looking at a curve. <laughs> but one e, what one e minus one is already too high. At this stage, we've left a period where the loss was decreasing steadily. In this learning rate plot, it appears that a learning rate around 3e minus 3 would be appropriate. So let's choose that. Train again. Note. Logarithmic scale. The learning rate finder plot has a logarithmic scale, which is why the middle point between 1e minus 3 and 1e minus 2 is between 3e minus 3 and 4e minus 3. This is because we care mostly about the order of magnitude of the learning rate. It's interesting that the learning rate finder was only discovered in 2015, while neural networks have been under development since the 1950s. Throughout that time, finding a good learning rate has been perhaps the most important and challenging issue for practitioners. The solution does not require any advanced math, the giant computing resources, huge datasets, or anything else that would make it inaccessible to any curious researcher. Furthermore, Leslie Smith was not part of some exclusive Silicon Valley lab, but was working as a naval researcher. All of this is to say, breakthrough work in deep learning absolutely does not require access to vast resources, elite teams, or advanced mathematical ideas. There's lots of work still to be done that requires just a bit of common sense, creativity, and tenacity. Now that we have a good learning rate to train our model, let's look at how we can fine-tune the weights of a pre-trained model. Unfreezing and transfer learning. Or, or not yet. Okay, we can come back to you. Can you go back to that graph really quick? Of course. And let's see. So I can we're, also we're take a screenshot at... and send it to you. No, it's okay. You can print it out and hang it on top of your bed. No, I, I just wanted to see where three minus, what is it, th minus three? Like, how did it get that? Scroll down a bit to get a three E minus three. 
where it says base learning rate of 3e minus 3. 3e. Oh, good question. Yeah. The, what's the 3? 1 e minus 1 is too high. 1 e minus 1. Is that here? No. 10 minus 1. So the steepest point, 4.37e minus 0, 0.3. Steepest point. Steep. So we can see on this plot that the range 1e minus 6 to 1e minus 3, nothing really happens and the model doesn't train. So let's scroll up a little bit. I think that's right the beginning part. I thought it's this, like 10 minus 6, which is not, I guess it's not 1e, e, or is it 1e e minus 6? Is that 10 minus 6? So I think I think it's just 1. So 10e minus 6 is just 1e e minus 5. Right? The minus 6 is just because it's 10. Ah, uh, and then that, okay, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, what does it say? So one, so one E minus six to one E minus three. So that's 10 E minus five to 10, yeah, e, 10 minus, e minus four. No, oh no, seven to five. four, seven to four. Seven to four? Which is, that would four, yeah. Makes sense, yeah. Then it starts to drop. And then one E minus one would be 10 to the power of zero. Yeah, it would be too high. Okay. Is it one E minus, can we do E conversion so that we're just, we're making, as this thing is still training? Uh, sure. Um, what would that be? So just do like one E minus e five. To decimal. Yeah. Okay, E equals that. So one E minus, no, no, no. Do uh, type into one Google e. one e minus five to the power of. Let me see one e minus five. Okay. And then just yeah, click on. Um, convert to. It's right, right there. In scientific notation, it means one times ten to the minus fifth. In other words, so it's one with four leading zeros that first one the first stack overflow right so minus five means it's one and then you're moving it over five decimal places so let's go back to the second which means that they'll get four leading zeros right mm -hmm. so if we go back to there and we see one e minus six that means right, we'll yes. That? that means okay. yeah. That that does mean ten e minus seven to ten e minus four, 10. which is correct. Yeah. And then all right. So we don't want a learning rate greater than one e minus one, as it will give a training that diverges, like the one before. But one e minus one is already too high at this stage. We've left the period with the loss was decreasing steadily. Mm -hmm. So one e minus one is ten. Here. Yeah. That's there. So. That's weird. Three E minus three. Pretty sure it's just, um, you know, point zero zero three. Oh, uh, okay. But how they get three, I don't. I'm not a hundred percent sure. Right? Mm -hmm. Like how did you derive three from this graph? Like three is falling on here somewhere, but I guess. Is it related to this? No, 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 no. I think, um, oops, I just minimized. Yeah, that's it. just the loss. It doesn't matter, but it's just, just the no lowest loss number, but it doesn't matter what it is. Where did you go? So three 
e minus 3 is minus 3 would be close to 10 minus 2. No. Close to 10 minus 4. Right? Because that's so 1 and then 2, 3, 4. No, no. So I think there's something also with this being logarithmic, right? And then if you look at the little, um, the little lines in this in this lower one, are these ten lines? One, two, three, four. I'm not sure. I cannot count. Yeah, I don't know how they're plotting this. Um, anyway, I think they're just picking something that's like, if it's 3e e minus 3, then it's somewhere between here. They're picking something, like there's this number between here. Why would it be here, not like right? closer to the lower point? Or maybe it's actually here. Yeah, that would make more sense. It might, uh, just visually looking at this graph. It's well, not so if... at the lowest point, but it's pretty low. Well, because 10 minus 2 is 1, 2 is just point 0.1, right? And then 3 minus 3 is 1, 2, 3 is point oh oh three, which would actually be somewhere here, no? Because mm -hmm. 10 minus 4 would be 0 0.001. So I think it's actually like here, a third. So somewhere here. How would that be the optimal learning rate? Like if you look at this graph. I have no idea. I don't know. I think they said something about... I don't know. Was not it, was it not like... Hmm... Yeah, I don't know. Mm. So, uh, so the training diverges like the one before. Okay. Has a logarithmic scale, which is why the middle point between 1 e minus 3 and 1 e minus 3 is between 3 e minus 3 and 4 e minus 3. This is because we care mostly about the order of magnitude of the learning rate. Yeah, that's that's fine. So they really only care about the second number mm -hmm. and that, that this is just in the single mm -hmm. digit. So... 3e e minus 3 is somewhere here. So, no, it is somewhere here, right? I'm not sure. <laughs> anyway, I think that's where it is. And then maybe let's. Uh... Anyway, we didn't, we said we weren't going to. Yeah, I'm not too into this. All right. I'm unfreezing. definitely not in my best thinking mode. Yeah, today, yeah. So. All right. <laughs> unfreezing and transfer learning. Okay, we discussed bri briefly before how transfer learning works. We saw that the basic idea is that a pre-trained model trained potentially on millions of data points, such as ImageNet, is fine-tuned for some other task. But what does it really mean? We now know that a conv convolutional neural network consists of many linear layers with a nonlinear activation function between each pair, okay, followed by one or more final linear layers with an activation function such as softmax at the very end. The final linear layer uses a matrix with enough columns such that the output size is the same as the number of classes in our model, assuming that we're doing classification. This final linear layer is unlikely to be of any use for us when we are fine tuning in a transfer learning setting because it is specifically designed to classify the categories in the original pre-training dataset. So when we do transfer learning, we remove it, throw it away and replace it with a new linear layer with the correct number of outputs for our desired task. In this case, there would be 37 activations. It's kind of something we also discussed with Gilad when we were looking at the different 
like what what does fine tune do and you know this freeze layer stuff mm -hmm. this newly this newly added linear layer will have entirely random weights therefore our model prior to fine tuning has entirely random outputs but that does not mean that it's an entirely random model all of the layers prior to the last one have been carefully trained to be good at image classification tasks in general as we saw in images from the Sila and Fergus paper wow <laughs> Choo, 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 choo. <laughs> the first few layers encode very general concepts such as finding gradients and edges and later layers encode concepts that are still very useful for us as finding eyebrows and fur we want to train a model in such a way that we allow it to remember all of these generally useful ideas from the pre-trained model use them to solve our particular task classify pet, pet breeds and only adjust them as re required for the specifics of our particular task our challenge when fine-tuning is to replace the random weights in our added linear layers with weights that correctly achieve our desired task, classifying pet breeds, without breaking the carefully pre-trained weights and the other layers. There's actually a very simple trick to allow this to happen. Tell the optimizer to only update the weights in those randomly added final layers. Don't change the weights in the rest of the neural network at all. This is called freezing, those pre-trained... Oh, I'm sorry. This is called freezing those pre pre-trained layers, yeah. When you create a model from a pre-trained network, FastAI automatically freezes all of the pre-trained layers for us. When we call the fine-tune method, FastAI does two things. It trains the randomly added layers for one epoch with all other layers frozen. It unfreezes all of the layers and trains, yeah, trains the randomly added layers for one epoch with all other layers frozen, unfreezes all of the layers and trains them all for the number of epochs requested. That's kind of like what we managed to find out after a lot of <laughs> a lot of talking about it mm -hmm. from that other session. Although this is reasonable, is a reasonable default approach. It is likely that for your particular data set, you might get may get better results by doing things slightly differently. The fine tune method has a number of parameters you can use to change its behavior, but it might be easiest for you to just call the underlying methods directly if you want to get some custom behavior. Remember that you can see the source code for the method by using the following syntax. Oh, no, I don't remember that. Yeah, I don't remember that either. So let's try doing this manually ourselves. First of all, we train the randomly added layers for three epochs using fit one cycle. As mentioned in fit one cycle is the suggested way to train models without using fine tune. We'll see why later in the, we'll, we'll see why later in the book. In short, what fit one cycle does is to start training at a lower learning rate, gradually increase it for the first section of training, and then gradually decrease it again for the last section of training. Start training at a lower learning rate, gradually increase it for the first section, gradually decrease it for the last section. Okay. Let's look at the source code. Uh -huh. Well, that's kind of helpful, huh? Mm -hmm. Even though it's not really... It's not, it's kind of weirdly formatted. Yeah, but you know what? I, I, I may also bite my tongue after saying this, but it seems like these double question marks will work more times than this, um, like the doc, the doc uh, function. Yeah, but if we, do we get any sort of, you know, like link here to, to takes us to? It doesn't, right? It's just, it actually takes it from the code directly, I guess. Yeah, I don't, this is hard to read for me, but whatever. Anyways, I'm sure anyway. we can get something from it. Learn CNN. Okay, so now we're doing fit one cycle. Look at this. All the stuff that we were trying to do in a couple of the last sessions. Yep. But with explanations, wow. Okay, data loader, ResNet 34. We're doing fit one cycle, three, and then there's our learning. So we're doing three epochs with a learning rate, with that learning rate. And it said it starts with a low one, increase it. So what, is that like the low one it starts with, or is that somewhat like a middle? I think this average? is the low one that we're starting with, and then we're going to increase the learning rate. That's what fit, fit one cycle does that automatically. Like it starts at a low one and gradually increases it, then decreases. Uh, okay, I thought we but were doing it manually. No. Gotcha. Okay. 
but I wonder what this is. Is it like uh, the start, the end, the top, the highest, the lowest, or something in the middle? Mm. I get what you mean. Mm -hmm. Okay, then we'll unfreeze the model. Unfreeze. And run learning rate, the learning rate find again, because having more layers to train and weights that have already been trained for three epochs means our previously found learning rate isn't appropriate anymore. Makes sense. No, did the graph? Oh, we're gonna get a graph. Yippee! <laughs> it's a little different from when we had random weights. We don't have the sharp descent that indicates the model is training. Well, that's because our model has been trained already. Here we have a somewhat flat area before a sharp increase, and we should take a point well before that sharp increase. For instance, when e minus five, the point with the maximum gradient isn't what we look for here and should be ignored. Okay. So they were really looking for the maximum gradient, it seems. So like, where is the curve the steepest? So before it starts flattening out again, mm -hmm. up here, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Which might actually be somewhere there where you thought it would be. Like the, I mean, I don't know. It's not It's not gonna be in between here, right? The steepest gradient. It's gonna be somewhere in between here. Must Let's be somewhere see. in here. Let's see. Let's see, how are we gonna see? This is still training. All right, let's wait for this. We can play some one, two, three in your turn. Ah, uh, sure. Ready? Okay. One. Wait, okay, so let's one, two, three, and then we start, okay? All right. One. Wait, I'm confused. What did I just say? Is it on three or is it after three? We do one. Okay, we do one, two, three, and then we start. One, two, three, okay? Okay. So, one, two, three. One, two, two three. Three. One, two, three. One, two, three. One, two, two, three. One, two, two, three. Ah. You get that. And we're finished. All right. Unfreeze the model. Unfreeze the model. Interesting. They all took the same exact time. Wow. Yeah, that's pretty. I like it. Okay. So now we're looking for a new learning rate on the whole, all of the layers from start to finish, including the pre tamed stuff from all the 34 layers of Resonant 34. Mm hmm. And we're going to get a graph. Okay, there it is. Indeed, it looks very different. So now it's telling us we don't really care for the lowest point and for the steepest slope. No. Anyways, not the steepest slope because we, we got to know whether it's going up or down, right? So up here, we might have been looking for the steepest decrease, mm -hmm. steepest point. Uh huh. It actually calls it steepest point. It could be up too, right? Who knows? Um, now we're not looking, we don't care. Here's somewhat flat area before a sharp increase. And we should take a point well before that sharp increase. For, for instance, one E minus five. So we have 10, so that would be somewhere here. One, is that it? 
then minus six would be one e minus mm -hmm. five. The point with the maximum gradient isn't what we're looking for here and should be ignored. Let's train at a suitable learning rate. This has improved our model a bit, but there's more we can do. The deepest layer of our pre-trained model might not need as high a learning rate as the last ones, so we should probably use different learning rates for those. This is known as using discriminative learning rates. Yes, also something we already heard about. Look at that. So we get discriminative learning rates, eight cells. So like the, I'm, I'm really tired, uh, not, not really tired, but not very concentrated mm -hmm. today. Okay, so we got, maybe we just finish this. It's not that much left. Sounds good. And then, and then where we should really do a fun, like just building some, maybe we should stop at this point and just do a couple of projects, you know, like not continue with lessons. So do uh, this, do this lesson. And then yeah. the next few streams just do mm -hmm. projects. Just build out some fun projects, whatever. Yeah, I think we have... I. Now that we know how to, to learn and determine um, not this, like, like it was saying, like, not the binary, like, is it, you know, hot dog or not hot dog, <laughs> right? <laughs> um, we could We could train on these, like, you know, multiple different categories. So we, we could figure out what else to do. And, um, mm -hmm. yeah, I'm, I'm sure we could come up with it. I want to do something some, with like, like a, like a, like a fish database and then use some of my diving footage to see mm -hmm. if we can like recognize a, a horseshoe crab or something. Yeah. Yeah. Something like that. Let's, um, yeah, we should totally do some practical it's after all called practical deep learning i've been uh, mm -hmm. i feel like we've, we've been doing a lot of theoretical stuff for a bunch of streams now how many more lessons in this book we're on chapter five it's a lot it goes like it goes pretty 11 far, i think something like that i think it's 12 or something yeah mm -hmm. which is cool i'm sure there's like lots to learn and train but uh, i just need a bit of baseball playing in between i guess yeah totally let's see what they show us here yeah look it's a bunch 20 actually oh well all right 20 is the I mean, uh, conclusion so we're on pet breeds the next okay but the next one multi-category so it seems like it's just going to go a little bit deeper um sizing collab TTA. tabular okay nlp it's interesting stuff but um nlp deep dive convolutional resnet no my goodness i think I think we. I mean, this is this is all interesting, but I, I have the feeling like we already, like we can already do a bunch of interesting stuff with what we have so far. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe it's gonna make it more. There's only uh, these are the uh, the lectures, right? That we stopped watching. Mm -hmm. I think we watched. Right. Maybe up to here or something. Uh huh. We stopped before data ethics. <laughs> <laughs> whatever that means <laughs> maybe we should watch that one that's all right um now, we should definitely watch these at some point too yeah, because yeah, yeah. we still have a, a lot to go in this course so for but sure yeah, let's start let's start doing some start doing some you're still training here huh i wonder how we could um I right, think six six epochs. Am I actually train. running a GPU? I might not be. I am. I think how could we train a model and then run that model over video, and then try to get like instance it like to count instances of puppies. Mm -hmm. I mean, we just have to split up the video into a bunch of images, right? In a into a a row of images, right? Because that's what it is. I guess so, yeah. And then we could define like a scene of the video to assume like if I had a video of regs and it was 30 frames per second and, you know, it's just pans to him for 10 seconds. Or I guess we could build something where it's like recognizes when there's a puppy 
in the scene and then it'll just count how many frames it's there until it leaves again until like it doesn't recognize Mm -hmm. rigs and then we could we could like inspect those in between frames the in between meaning what in between what so if i have like a 10 second video yeah um and where the first second is regs is not on screen and the last second he's not on screen mm-hmm. and we're breaking this up on all the individual frames i'd like to see at what point does this model that we train recognize that he's in the frame is he mm-hmm. like halfway at what point in the in, okay yeah, yeah, and then the same thing leaving because right because with video it's it's also you get that like blur of moving the camera a bit so I wonder yeah I wonder um, when it would recognize right I wonder yeah I wonder what the blur looks like if you split it if you you know segment it into just the individual images that it consists of mm-hmm. uh-huh yeah I don't know um, there's probably like some way of like reading in you know a stream of images a video essentially i'm pretty sure they've got something like that built in so i i think that's interesting uh, i would still suggest that when we if we move into images that we should do some something with images first you know uh or maybe not i we mean build a, it's, yeah, you we know can, whatever we want right whatever. All right, let's read some more. So this is going to give us some better output than it did before. Uh, even after we unfreeze, discriminative. So now we want to say, okay, don't always use the same, le- same learning rate, but use a different learning rate depending on what layer you're working with. Even after we unfreeze, we still care a lot about the quality of uh, the, those pre-trained weights. We would not expect that the best learning rate for those pre-trained parameters would be as high for the randomly added parameters even after we have turned those randomly added parameters, tuned those randomly added parameters for a few epochs. Remember the pre-trained weights have been trained for hundreds of epochs on millions of images. In addition, do you remember the images we saw somewhere else showing that showing what each layer learns? The first layer learns very simple foundations like edge and gradient detectors. These are likely to be just as useful for nearly any task. The later layers learn much more complex concepts like eye and sunset which might not be as useful in your task at all. Maybe you're classifying car models, for instance. So it makes sense to let the later la- layers fine tune more, cl- more quickly than earlier layers. Therefore, FastAI's default approach is to use uh, discriminative learning rates. This was originally developed in the ULM FIT approach to NL- NLP transfer learning that we will introduce some other time. <laughs> like <laughs> many good ideas in deep learning, it is extremely simple. Use a lower learning rate for the early layers of the neural network and a higher learning rate for the later layers, and especially the randomly added layers. The idea is based on insights developed by Jason Yusinski, who showed in 2014 that with transfer learning, different layers of a neural network should train at different speeds, as seen somewhere else. Probably here. Top, top one accuracy, higher is better. Layer N at which network is chopped and retrained. First layer, transfer layer, transfer plus fine learning improves generalization, fine learning recovers co adapted interactions. Yeah. First layer, let's press slice object and where they're learning blah, 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 blah. Do you want to go see that graph? We just, <laughs> we finished the. Uh, we got a graph there? No, we just got this. This, yeah, yeah. So, uh, p- t- 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 017 training loss 018 validation loss and before we had oh it's much better actually yeah Mm -hmm. Hmm. i mean we also trained it for more epochs though so 32 still better yeah yeah okay Hmm. cool All right. Uh... <laughs> wow, I'm just skipping ahead. Yuri. Yeah, I'm really. It's like. Oh. I'm like, am I am I scrolling? Because this sounds like this looks like 
when Nick scrolls and he just skips ahead a bunch. <laughs> All right, power up scroll. I can I can prove that any scrolling that happens henceforth happens on Nick's there you half. Go. All right, fast AI, fast AI lets you pass a Python slice object anywhere the learning rate is expected. The first value pass will be the learning rate in the earliest layer of the neural network. The second value will be learning rate in the final layer. The layers in between will have learning rates that are multiplicatively equidistant. Multiplicatively. 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 Multiplicatively equidistant. This is a difficult Monday for sure. Throughout the range, let's use this approach to replicate the previous training, but this time we'll only set the lowest layer of our net to a learning rate of 1 e minus 6, and other layers will scale up to 1 e minus 4. Let's train for a while and see what happens. Oh my goodness, we're going to train again. <laughs> we're doing a lot of training. Yeah, a lot of training. <laughs> but okay, so the interesting thing is here we see that you can pass in like a start and stop learning rate. So here yes. we're training for one cycle. Okay, and then we're gonna unfreeze and then train again of oh, 12. My goodness. It's gonna take a while. It's gonna take a long yeah. time. All right. And then we're passing in uh, a yeah. maximum, yeah, this too. Now the fine tuning is working great, or we think we're jumping ahead. <laughs> All right. It's kind of, this is gonna take a long time. This is gonna take another mm -hmm. like 30 minutes, most likely. We might not see the end of this. Yeah, seriously. <laughs> All right, so let's just assume that this is working great. Um, as you can see, the training loss keeps getting better and better, but notice the eventually the validation loss improvement slows and sometimes even gets worse. This is the point at which the model is starting to overfit. In particular, the model is becoming overconfident of its predictions, but this does not mean that it is getting less accurate necessarily. Take a look at the table of training results per e epoch and you will often see that the accuracy continues improving even as the validation loss gets worse in the end what matters is your accuracy or more generally your chosen metrics not the loss the loss is just the function we've given the computer to help us optimize okay another decision is the epochs all right so let's i guess we could just finish this sum it up yeah okay uh, all right. Should I read? Sure. Okay. okay. Selecting the number of epochs. Often you will find that you are limited by time rather than generalization and accuracy when choosing how many epochs to train for. So your first approach to training should be to simply pick a number of epochs that will train in the amount of time that you're happy to wait for. Then look at the training and validation loss plots as shown above and in particular your metrics. And if you see that they're still getting better even in your final epochs, then you know that you have not trained for too long. On the other hand, you may well see the met that the metrics you have chosen are really getting worse at the end of training. Remember, it's not just that we're looking for the validation loss to get worse, but the actual metrics. Your validation loss will first get worse during training because the model gets overconfident and only later will get worse because it is incorrectly memorizing the data. We only care in practice about the lad la ladder, well, ladder issue. Remember, our loss function is just something that we use to allow our optimizer to have something it can differentiate and optimize. It's not actually the thing we care about in practice. Before the days, back in the days, before the days of one cycle training, it was very common to save the model at the end of each epoch and then select whichever model has the best, had the best accuracy out of all the models saved in each epoch. This is known as early stopping. However, this is very unlikely to give you the best answer because those epochs in the middle occur before the learning rate has had a chance to reach the small values where it can really find the best result. Therefore, if you find that you have overfit, where you, what, you have, what you should actually do is retrain your model from scratch and this time select the total number of epochs based on where your previous best results were found. Wait. That if you found that you have overfit, what you should actually do is retrain your model from scratch and this time select a total number of epochs based on where your previous best results were found. Okay. If you have the time to train for more epochs, you may want to instead use that time to train more parameters, that is, use a deeper architecture. Deeper architectures. Nick. Sure. Um, deeper architectures. In general, a model with more parameters can model your data more accurately. 
there are lots and lots of caveats to this generalization and it depends on the specifics of the architectures you are using but it is a reasonable rule of thumb for now for most of the architectures that we will be seeing in this book you can create larger versions of them by simply adding more layers however since we want to use pre-trained models we need to make sure that we choose a number of layers that have already been pre-trained for us this is why in practice architectures tend to come in a small number of variants for instance the resnet architecture that we are using in this chapter comes in variants of 18 34 50 101 and 152 layers pre-trained pre-trained on ImageNet. a larger more layers and parameters sometimes described as the capacity of a model version of resnet will always be available to give us better training loss it able always be able what did i say available available my goodness but it can suffer more from overfitting because it has more parameters to overfit with in general a bigger model has the ability to better capture the real underlying relationships in your data and also to capture and memorize the specific details of your individual images however using a deeper model is going to require more gpu ram so you may need to lower the size of your batches to avoid an out of memory error this happens when you try to fit too much inside your gpu gpu and looks like this cuda runtime error out of memory you may have to restart your notebook when this happens the way to solve it is to use a smaller batch size, which means passing smaller groups of images at any given time through your model. You can pass the batch size you want to call the... Oh my goodness. BS equals. You can pass you can the pass batch the size. <laughs> I just want to be nice. <laughs> you can pass the batch size you want to the call, creating your data loaders with BS equals. The other downside of deeper architectures is that they take quite a bit longer to train. One technique that can speed things up a lot is mixed precision training. This refers to using less precise numbers, half precision floating point, also called FP16, where possible during training. As we are writing these words in early 2020, nearly all current NVIDIA GPUs support a special feature called tensor cores that can dramatically speed up neural network training by two to three times. They also require a lot less GPU memory to ensure this feature in FastAI just add to FP16. After your learner creation, you also need to import the module. You can't really know ahead of time what the best architecture for your particular problem is. You need to try training some, so let's try ResNet 50 now with mixed precision. All right, we're still training this top one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, still on it. I wonder. Yeah, I don't think we're going to get to the end of this training. But that's okay. nearly at the end. Okay, I see. Right here. So you'll see mm -hmm. here we've gone back to using fine tunes since it's so handy. We can pass freeze epochs to tell FastAI how many epochs to train for while frozen. It will automatically change learning rates appropriately for most data sets. In this case, we're not seeing a clear win from the deeper model. This is useful to remember. Bigger models aren't necessarily better models for your particular case. Make sure you try small models before you start scaling up. Cool. Cool. Conclusion. In this chapter, you learned some important practical tips, both for getting your image data ready for modeling, precising data block summary, and for fitting the model learning rate finder and freezing discriminative learning rates, setting the number of epochs, and using deeper architectures. Using these tools will help you to build more accurate image models more quickly. We also discussed cross entropy loss. This part of the book is worth spending plenty of time on. You aren't likely to need to actually implement cross entropy excuse me, loss from scratch yourself in practice, but it's really important you understand the inputs to and outputs from that function because it, or a var variant of it, as we'll see in the next chapter, is used in nearly every classification model. So when you want to debug a model or put a model in production or improve the accuracy of a model, you're going to need to be able to look at its activations and loss and understand what's going on and why. You can't do that properly if you don't understand your loss function. If cross entropy loss hasn't clicked for you just yet, yay, that's me. Don't worry, you'll get there. 
first go back to the last chapter and make sure you really understand MNIST loss. And then work gradu gradually through the cells of the notebook for this chapter, where we step through each piece of cross entropy loss. Make sure you understand what each calculation is doing and why. Try creating some small tensors yourself, yourself and pass them into the functions to see what they return. Remember, the choices made in the implementation of cross entropy loss are not the only possible choices that could have been made. Just like when we looked at regression, we could choose between mean squared error and mean absolute difference L1. If you have other ideas for possible functions that you think might work, feel free to give them a try in this chapter's notebook. Fair warning though, you'll probably find that the model will be slower to train and less accurate. That's because the gradient of cross entropy loss is proportional to the difference between the activation and the target. So stochastic gradient descent always gets a nicely scaled step for the weights. Okay, for cells. So Thiv, of questions. Thiv King is heading out. Oh yeah. But yeah. Gotta go. I think we also gotta go. Yeah, we're then. gonna we're gonna close this up soon too. <laughs> um, yeah. But thanks yeah. for hanging out. Yeah, thanks for hanging out. Just but yeah, chat. let's cross it up too, huh? What do you say? There's a nice questionnaire. We've stopped we haven't really we should probably do these questionnaires also at some point. And I'm sure they're good for learning. But let's do some practical stuff next time. Yeah, I agree. I think next time we should um, start applying some of the stuff that we learned here and in, in the last lesson. Actually, applying it to the to the dog breed classifier. Should we, or should we do something new? Should Actually, like, you know what? Right. Let's <laughs> no, no, no. Let's let's do that. Let's wrap that one up. But you know what? Can you? So don't close this tab because this is going to take a while. So mm -hmm. let's also run this one, right? Mm -hmm. And then... Do you want to like see, the, uh, should I post a picture of them somewhere or something? No, 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 in the, in the next, if you want to screenshot this page, sure, or just keep it open, but in the mm -hmm. next stream, that way we can compare what we actually finish ours with. Okay. You know what I mean? Right. All right. Yeah, because it's going to save it in the notebook too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, I'll let it finish running and then close it afterwards. All right, cool. So until next time, everybody. Bye-bye. <laughs> Project time next time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Project time.